Welcome to the Rotowire Prospect Podcast. I'm Clay Link alongside James Anderson, a lead prospect writer at rotowire.com. Good to be back talking with you, James. Beautiful HD video here as well. Um, for those who want to check us out on YouTube, of course, if you listen to this podcast on your, your normal channels, it should show up there as well. But good to be uh, seeing your face, James. And, uh, you know, we typically start this back up around the Arizona Fall League. Of course, no Fall League this year. Uh, but we, we still have plenty to talk about and some early ADP to dig into. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's definitely great to be talking with you. Um, we haven't seen each other in person in, in months. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, we are getting the, the road of our YouTube channel off the ground. And so we've got the, the video version of this going as well. So, uh, should be, should be fun. Yeah, man. It's kind of new, you know, uncharted territory for me. I know you've done a few of these with Nick Whalen doing good stuff, but, um, you know, looking forward to adding this new element to the pod and, uh, we'll be doing our usual thing probably only every like three weeks or so throughout the off season, but um, and not, nothing to really gauge these players off of in terms of on the field production, no stats. So that, that makes your job harder, especially as we dig into the magazine process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been trying to get as much information as I can from sources and stuff like that. Uh, you, you obviously see lots of like video clips and stuff on Twitter. You might see like a, a box score from the instructional league on Twitter and stuff like that, but uh, definitely a challenging off season. Uh, you know, I've been using a lot of my old uh, journalism era search tactics to try to track down information on these guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's different, but it's it's still fun. Yeah, I know you. You know, you do a ton of legwork for the A to Z section of the magazine. I've been doing that as well, trying to uh, stay focused on that. I got the PS5 looming. James, I know you're a big gamer, uh, but looking forward to that. And yeah, it's just this off season grind of trying to get this magazine done in time. I, you, uh, I know we're typically aimed for early December for the draft kit. Do you feel good about that ETA? Yeah, man. Uh, nice. I probably won't have all my all my prospect outlooks done by then, but we'll have uh, plenty of, plenty done to go live on the site and. I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're hungry for prospect content, you know, the guys at Prospects Live are doing a great job with their their team rankings and stuff like that. I mean, there's there's lots of good outlets out there that are, that are pumping it out right now. But uh, the way we do it is we, we take a few months and just get a lot of this stuff done. And then it gets on the site um, December, the magazine gets done in January, and then Around that time, I'll start pumping out, you know, multiple articles each week. But there's there's lots of good prospect stuff out there if you're, if you're thirsty for it. Yeah, and the the first wave of outlooks, the first 600 plus players projections, that should all be live to the site, as you said, in December. Hopefully, early to mid December, and then the product will just grow from there. The draft kit. So I'm looking forward to it. No no set choice on the cover boy this year, right? Uh, I know Tatis. Probably the front runner for most uh, fantasy sites. Uh, tempting, but maybe we'll have to switch it up. We'll have to talk about that. But by the way, uh, review our pod if you get a chance. Only if you like the pod, by the way. Rotowire.com slash pod. Also give us a like on YouTube. And James, you had kind of a cool uh, convo with one of our friends on Twitter, friend of the pod, Young Bat Company. Sounds like you had a little giveaway in mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Young Back Company is a, a cool uh, company. They, they deal in real wooden bats and stuff like that, but they also make these cool mugs. And uh, we're going to be holding a contest uh, that you can participate in, and we'll have uh, details to win one of those mugs at the, the end of the podcast. Yeah, I might have to get in on that myself. I could always use a new <laughs> coffee mug. Uh, but, James, you broke down ADPs. Now, this is... The NFPC drafts got a little, started a little bit earlier this year, but not a ton of drafts to go on, but it looks like about five drafts uh, yeah, compiling this ADP data. There are three 50-round draft champions in the books, and then two of the 50s uh, are in the books. Um, and, you know, to me, I, I know the ADP data is kind of it's kind of all over the place. You'll see some ones where you're just kind of like, 
that that looks a little wonky, but I, I I find this more valuable than the like too early mock data. I'd I'd much rather kind of look at where the people that are putting money in um, are kind of headed this time of year than than the people that are just kind of doing it for fun. So I know it's only five drafts, but it's it's the first kind of snapshot we're getting of the the market landscape. So I think it's um, especially with prospects. I mean, these guys are all like, we're not going to be talking about like Luis Robert. We're not going to be talking about Jake Cronenworth guys that have lost prospect eligibility. Um, so these guys are all guys where they've got, you know, 130 uh, or, or fewer at bats in the majors, uh, 50 innings or fewer in the majors. So, you know, the, the drafting public has sort of decided where these guys should be going, but I think there's definitely room for, for profit or perhaps uh, guys where you should pretty strongly avoid it at their current price just because we're reacting off of such a small sample size. Yeah, so early in this, the market for all these players will shift, of course, but it, it is good to get a little early snapshot from paying fantasy players. And all due respect to the two early mocks and Justin Mason, uh, Samada, our friend, we appreciate the work they do. But those are largely completed uh, before the, the postseason wraps up, so some of the helium on guys like, Randy Rosarena and others not going to really be built in. So I think this does give us a little bit of a better uh, snapshot. Now, Rosarena, through those first five uh, NFBC drafts, a 54 ADP. Um, you know, he had a really good run at the end of the regular season than the, the postseason historic. It was a longer postseason than normal, but still to set the record in home runs and hits in a single postseason is, is incredible. Uh, I'm a little nervous at this price, though. What do you think, James? Are you buying in at around pick 50 on Randy Rosarena? I don't think it's a unfair price, uh, but I don't expect that I will be taking him if you know he's going right next to Starling Marte. He's going about 10 spots ahead of Trent Grisham. Um, yeah, 15 spots ahead of Teoscar Hernandez. Uh, you know, there, there are guys that I just I kind of like a little bit more or maybe just the same who are going um, around that same spot. So, I, I mean, I think 2020 is, is definitely the selling point for the Razarena, and there's no real reason to think he can't get to 2020 when you look at his power output and you look at his – uh, sprint speed and his his steals totals. I think 2020 is definitely in play, um, but I think it's in play with with a few other guys that are going in this area too. Uh, I guess do do you think this is where he'll be going in mid to late March? Like where do you see Arazarena's uh, market price kind of evolving over the over the off season? Yeah, that's a good question. I see the market cooling a little bit on him, um, especially as you know main events get going and pushing gets pushing, uh, pitching gets pushed up. Um, I imagine guys like Rosarena will just inevitably fall a little bit. So I, I think this is about right, but maybe sixties, sixty to seventy, that just seems about right. I just you know it's kind of a lazy comp, but I just think you have to look no further than his teammate Austin Meadows than. Uh, for a cautionary tale, a guy who you, you look at him, he had such a great run, you think, all right, he's locked into everyday playing time. But can you really assume that with any player on this team? I just don't know. Yeah, I, I wrote a Rosarena's outlook already, and that, that's basically the, you know, the how it could go wrong. Like, I don't think we're going to see him platoon to start the year. I think he, you know, obviously was their, by far their best hitter down the stretch i think that that probably earns him an everyday role out of the gate but when you're talking about a roster that's that talented if he starts scuffling against righties they have plenty of strong left-handed bats that they can get in there so i, I don't think it's going to be an issue early in the season i think the concern comes you know if maybe he, he cools off against righties and maybe he only starts 130 games on the year or something like that. I mean, we, we've seen the Rays be ruthless with platoons before. I mean, they even started platooning uh, Brandon Lau, I think, to, towards the end of the year. Uh, as you mentioned, Meadows is not immune from, from being sad against lefties. So uh, they have just so much talent that if a guy – I mean, Arasarena's splits in the minors are, are definitely 
Stark. I mean, he's hit lefties better pretty much at every stop except for the postseason. The postseason was the only time he hit righties better than lefties. Um, if that continues, then he's probably a, a bargain where he's going, but uh, I don't think we should just expect him to just be that dominant against both righties and lefties throughout the regular season. They just have so much talent that's kind of knocking on the door already there that uh, they don't have to let anyone play through any scuffles. Yeah, I also wonder how much he'll really run. I mean, he didn't didn't steal a bag in the postseason, did steal four during the regular season. I guess it just he's kind of the classic example of the, the great philosophical question facing fantasy owners um, in 2021, and just how much do you weigh track record against what we've just recently seen? It's kind of always the big question for fantasy is how much you you know weigh recency bias. But um, I just think he's, with the Rose Arena, it's it's scary to to fully buy in at that price. I think he's even tougher to value uh, for for dynasty and and like a prospect. Like he's still prospect eligible. And he's six years older than Wanda Franco, so it's just like, what do you what do you even do with him? Yeah, another guy getting some hype, uh, Ian Anderson of the Braves, ADP at eighty eight. Uh, this is another one that scares me. I can all, pretty much already, you know, assume I'm not going to have any Ian Anderson next year. Great run this season. Uh, what do you think? Do you have any hesitation about Ian Anderson inside the top one hundred? Yeah. I'm not touching him inside the top 100. Um, there's just so the the number one trend that I I sort of noticed when I put together that that super early set of rankings I did for uh, for redraft leagues about a month ago, and I've already done a couple of draft champions myself. Like the one thing that really stands out to me is just how bad the pitching inventory is, uh, relievers and starters, but mostly starters. I mean, like. The guys you have to take, uh, like the quality of pitcher you're taking kind of around this sort of 90 to 130 range is much lesser than the quality of pitcher you could get in that range last year. And the yeah, big reason that for too. that, yeah, the like like Marco Gonzalez, like I love Marco Gonzalez and I actually might get some shares of him, but he's going, you know, in a range where last year you could get Kenta Maeda and um so i think you're you're gonna see pitching pushed up you're gonna see these guys without much track record pushed up uh so i on one hand i kind of understand it but you also have to look at the players going after him on average i mean you can get dylan bundy later than him you can get framber valdez later than him you can get sandy alcantara later than him um in in some cases like two or three yeah um so i i just don't think Ian Anderson is special enough to uh, be pushed up this high. I mean, the, the changeup's great, um, but I mean, he does not have a long track record of even average command. If you go back to his his minor league days, so um, this is a really hefty price to pay, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm just a little scared because of that command that you said. It, it kind of just was night and day once he got to the majors. Like he showcased pretty good command, right? Um, right, but it just hard to bet on that continuing given what we've seen throughout his career. Uh, Sixto Sanchez kind of had the pitching equivalent of like the uh, Austin Riley, Aristides Aquino uh, run this year. He was so good initially, but then kind of scuffled and uh, only a 12 to 11 K to walk over his final four starts postseason included. So he's got that velo, but that stark contrast from a 29 to five K to walk in his first five starts to just the, that that number leveling out to pretty much one to one, uh, pretty scary. And I just I guess I don't know who Sixto Sancho Sixto Sanchez is quite yet. I I'm gonna bet on the stuff with him and the track record. I mean, throwing strikes has not really been an issue for him uh, prior to that run you mentioned. And uh, I actually think where he's going uh, around 100, you know, 107. I guess is the ADP. I think that that's a pretty solid price. I, I had him ranked inside my top 100. I mean, you're again, you're not in love with what you have to do in terms of taking Sixto Sanchez there, but there's not a single pitcher really in that range um, where I think you can say, oh yeah, for sure, lock it up. Um, these guys all carry some element of risk, and I think Sanchez's upside is such that I'd, I'd be okay 
uh, taking him there. I mean, there's there's there are still guys going. Like I I, I prefer his teammate Alcantara is going later, but I, I'd be fine taking six though there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is crazy. I've noticed that too. Just looking at early boards, just how much that pitching does drop off, and maybe that'll force me up to getting a couple aces. I've never been a you know a pocket aces guy myself, but just the building a nine man staff beyond pick fifty or whatever, it's just going to be hard. Uh, Tristan McKenzie, he's going at 126. So if that's the kind of guy you're taking at 126, that kind of just reinforces the the point we've been making about the pitching this, this upcoming season. Uh, small guy, slim, um, lanky, but really great debut for Tristan McKenzie of Cleveland. Yeah, uh, of all the guys we're going to talk about today, I think his ADP is, is kind of the most uh, – outrageous like i I, people just panicking at that point i don't understand it at all uh like cal quantrill is going 250 picks later and i would bet on quantrill making more starts for the indians next year than mckenzie i I just think you you can't look at mckenzie's like past three years and project like i wouldn't even project 100 innings in the rotation for him this year um, you look at the physical issues. You mentioned how how slight he is. It, it's one of those frames. I mean, he is six five, but it's one of those frames where he's just been in, unable to add weight. Um, and you worry about how a guy like that holds up. He's already dealt with a very serious back injury in his career. You can imagine Cleveland's going to be extremely careful with how they deploy him in 2021, with keeping their eye on on 2022, 2023 with him. Uh, so. I mean, yeah, he had a he had a great debut year, uh, especially that first outing. But even you know later in the the year, the velo started to decline already with him. Um, so I, I I like the talent, but you just have to be realistic about how many innings you're getting out of him. I I mean, I look at the pitchers going next to him, guys that are probably going to double him up in innings. Um, and you just you really need to value. Uh, the amount of workload you're getting from a starting pitcher if you're going to take him that high. Yeah, I've got a few pounds I could give Tristan if he's looking to um, <laughs> <laughs> bulk up a little bit. Hit me up, Tristan, if you want to work that out. Uh, but, yeah, he's got – he only had like three Ks in each of his final three outings. Didn't go more than you know four and a third in any, any of his last – uh, five outings, including the postseason. So yeah, just the, the velo dip, as you said, and the track record. That seems like a really high price to pay for Tristan McKenzie. And Cal Quantrill is a good name to just keep in mind. If I'm doing early drafts, he's a guy I want to get pretty much everywhere if I can, because I just trust that Cleveland uh, development staff. On the hitting side, Ryan Mountcastle was a little bit of a surprise. I know you weren't expecting a ton uh, when he came in, but he did okay. And uh, 138 ADP early on. I'd much rather have Dylan Carlson going right behind him. Uh, do you agree with me on that one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'd rather have Carlson going right behind him at 139, and I'd rather have Brian Hayes going behind both of them at 149. I mean, I'd rather have Carlson, I think, than Hayes, but I mean, I think I think Carlson and Hayes are close. Mountcastle's just, he's kind of a, a different tier for me. I mean, I think the I think he's going to be fine, but I think what he gives you in fantasy is just not that unique. Like you know, if you're projecting a 300 average next year, I think you're going to be disappointed. I, I think everything kind of points to him being a bit over his head there. And then power, yeah, I mean he'll, he'll hit like 25 homers. Um, so he's just going to be a guy that kind of gives you that like 270, 25 homer line, which is which is fine but it's not a hard statistical profile to track down like 75 picks later in a draft uh so i think the other guys what they can bring to the table is just a bit more unique so i'm with you there yeah obviously great park to hit in and a lot of good parks in that division but uh, i look at him and yeah i mean the 159 iso is just very middling in this kind of era of the juice ball and just not a lot there. Three ninety eight Babip. I you know I hate the like lucky drop mic stuff, but that's clearly lucky when you're pushing four hundred. And, and what one thing I've mentioned with Mountcastle is he's one of those guys where I think he he maybe makes contact with too many pitches. Like he he 
he can get his bat on the ball uh, on pitchers pitches. And it, it kind of, I think that's where that ISO comes from is he was not necessarily drive waiting to drive pitches. He was just making contact with stuff and they were, he was finding hits, but um, he's not the type of guy that's going to really work the count and, and make the pitcher throw him a pitch that he can drive. Yeah. We talked early in the show about how this is very preliminary and we expect the market to change and evolve this is one where I clearly see these two flipping um, as we get closer to opening day with Carlson maybe getting up close to pick 100. I think people are probably remembering and factoring in too much of his initial struggles. But when he came back from the minors, he was awesome and ended up hitting cleanup for that team. I think that's a big statement by them as to where they see Dylan Carlson. Yeah, I. it's, it's kind of crazy to think about, but – you know, he got sent down in early September. And as you said, he, he got uh, recalled on September 18th. And if you include the playoffs um, from the time he got back through the end of the postseason, he slashed 288, 389, 533, and was the Cardinals best hitter from the moment he came back uh, through the end of the season. So the one really nice thing with Carlson, like we can kind of leave like stats and skills aside, but in terms of role, I'm extremely confident in Carlson's role heading into next season. Like he's probably going to start the year hitting somewhere in the top four of that lineup and his job's going to just be safe um, from, from the get go. Like it's not a, even like Gavin Lux, who's not prospect eligible. I think his role is much more in flux heading into next year than Carlson's because of the way Carlson finished the season. And so you know, you're always looking at job security, where a guy's going to hit in the lineup. Uh, I think those are big check marks for, for Carlson. I mean, it's not like Hayes or Mountcastle. You have to worry about the playing time either. But I think that that's important to point out with Carlson. You might just look at the whole line and be like, well, is he even going to play? Like, yeah, he's going to play. He was their best hitter down the stretch. Yeah, when a guy slots in fourth, and I think he was the youngest guy to hit clean up for that team since Pools. Uh, 21, I think he just turned 22 recently. So just a ton to like. And you love seeing a guy make those adjustments after he had those, those struggles and get sent down. You love to see him come back and uh, have some success. It makes you feel a little bit better about him figuring things out and really hitting his stride to begin 2021. Cabrian Hayes of the Pirates, we knew he was going to be great defensively, and he was very much that as advertised at third base, but really an impressive and surprising to me Uh, performance with the bat from Cabrian Hayes. So he's going around pick 150, 149 through these first five NFBC drafts. And I saw uh, our buddy Jeff Zimmerman make an interesting comp. Like maybe he's kind of like Frankie Lindor where the offense has some questions, but he just, once he gets to the majors, things click. Do you see Cabrian Hayes having, you know, upside to maybe finish next year as like a top, let's say 50 to 75 type of player? Yeah, I do. And I think I actually hadn't seen that from Jeff, but I, I think that that's a really good pull just if you're kind of looking. Um, and with Hayes, like he's always had this type of raw power in the bat. So it was just kind of a matter of, was he going to start getting to it in games? And he also played in a lot of pitcher friendly environments in the minor leagues that, that may have suppressed some of that power. But um, you know, it, I think people that maybe don't follow prospects as closely uh, might look at like Hayes and Mountcastle and sort of say, well, you know, what's the difference? Like one of them's going to be in Baltimore, the other's in Pittsburgh. I'll just take the guy in Baltimore. Uh, Hayes was pretty much always the better prospect um, was always, you know, 50 to a hundred spots higher on my rankings than Mountcastle. And the big thing that I don't think a ton of people are talking about and it's it's because, I mean, he only stole one base in 24 games. But I could see him stealing 12 to 15 bags next year. Uh, the sprint speed backs that up. His minor league uh, stolen base totals suggest that he could at least be a double-digit guy uh, playing in, playing on that team. I mean, I know he didn't run last year, so maybe, maybe they're just not going to have him run. But, I mean, it's a rebuilding team. Usually guys on rebuilding teams are given the green light a bit more. So... Um, you know, I think when you're doing these drafts, you have to be really strategic about where you're getting your stolen bases that they they almost all come from outfielders or middle infielders. But if you end up taking a guy like, uh, Eloy Jimenez or Corey Seager 
early in a draft who's not going to give you speed at those positions, I think taking a guy like Hayes later makes a lot of sense because he could maybe uh, help get you those stolen bases that you're not getting from that more traditional position. Yeah, that's going to be such a tough category to figure out, as always. But, I mean, just just so hard to to piecemeal those together. I know you love that word. Uh, these next two guys, not going to be the top, you know, quote-unquote prospects going in drafts, but the probably the two most highly touted prospects who are going to be playing next year, Wander Franco, Jared Kalnick. And Franco caused a little bit of a stir when he tweeted out his uh, World Series jersey they did not make that move to, to add him but uh no questions that we'll see him next year i guess the question only with franco is when yeah I, nobody really knows um and the rays don't know <laughs> like they they have such a stacked roster that um whenever they do decide to hand uh, him him a job they're gonna be displacing a, a quality big leaguer to, to give him that opportunity. So um, there's tons of profit potential on both of these guys where they're going, you know, just inside the top 200 for Franco, just outside the top 200 for, for Kelnick. Um, you know, I, I think spring training is really going to dictate where these guys end up going in, in March drafts, because if Kelnick's the talk of, spring training and it looks like he's just definitely getting the Chris Bryant treatment. He'll be up mid April, maybe even signs an extension with the team. You could see him going inside the top 100 by the end of March. Uh, I don't really see that type of upward momentum for Franco, just because I think there is going to just be so much more uncertainty with him because of the depth on, uh, on that roster. But for now, I, for now, I actually think I kind of prefer Kellenic, Um if I'm taking one of them in that range because I think there is more certainty there on the playing time and, and how early he debuts. Like Franco, I think you're right. We definitely are going to see him next year, but maybe we don't see him till like mid-May or mm-hmm. early June or something like that. And at that point, you're stashing a guy that you took inside the top 200 for, for maybe two months um that could still pay off like he's talented enough for that to pay off but he's also a guy who uh he's thickened up a little bit over the past like 18 months and i don't think he's got the same type of stolen base upside that he he did maybe uh, a year or two ago so he's not a guy where i think even if he were to open the year or maybe get the call in, in April, I still would probably take the under on like 20 steals from Franco. So you're, you're still asking him to, to do a lot of the damage there with the bat. And um, he could do it, but I just think there's there's enough uncertainty about the ETA there that uh, I think I'd prefer Kalanick at their ADPs. Interesting. I did not know that Franco had beefed up a little bit. That's, that's good to know. And in the, kind of as you mentioned, it's just so crowded, already a AL pennant winning roster. And then, as our friend David Scott on Twitter mentioned, a lot of other talented prospects coming up, Vidal Brujan, Josh Lowe, Kevin Padlow. So it's not like he's the only you know, notable good prospect on the way. So uh, like with everybody on that team, it's just hard to figure out from a fantasy perspective. Uh, Kelnick, you know I'm going to be back in again. I jumped the gun, <laughs> oh, paid the price, had him on a lot of rosters. You were, uh, you were a year early. Hey, just a year too early. I, I do think he probably would have forced their hand over a full season, shortened season. Absolutely. It was just not a not an option. Uh, Leody Tavares, he was kind of uh, a guy I didn't really pay much mind to during the season. I know he was leading off occasionally for the Rangers, but uh, not a ton of success. He did steal eight bags, though, and he was eight for eight, so did not get caught once. Uh, this profile scares me, striking out you know, close to a third of the time. I don't think I'm going to be in, but this is a, definitely a makeup play in the in the stolen base category if you need it. Yeah, I I actually kind of like it. Like, you know, I don't think you go into the draft saying I'm I'm getting to Barris, but if you are like you said, if you're unable to get the stolen bases you think you need, he's one of my favorite guys to pivot to because you know he's. He's in their long-term plans. He's a good defensive outfielder. Um, 
I'm not saying that he's above, like he could struggle to the point that they demote him uh, in season. That, that could happen. But this isn't a Danny Santana thing where he's just some journeyman guy who they're not planning on, on really doing anything with long term, who's going to be super susceptible to just getting benched or maybe even uh, cast off the 40, man. I mean, Tavares is kind of their center fielder of the future. And so I think the playing time, it, it should be there if he can just kind of keep his head above water. Really, like if he can kind of just do what he did last year, I think he probably still gets to keep playing on a pretty much everyday basis. And as you alluded to, there's, you know, there's a lot of upside in the stolen base category, but he also tapped into more power. Like his ISO his one sixty eight ISO last year was higher than at any level of the minors. So that's a burgeoning tool for him. And so we could be looking at a, like a 15 Homer 25 steel guy. Um, it's probably not going to come with a batting average of two fifty. It you know, might be more like two thirty five, two forty. Uh, but if you just kind of get shut out on some of your mid-round speed targets and you're hurting there, I think Tavares is a good guy to pivot to. Yeah, you'd think on that team the playing time would be pretty safe, but if you really struggle, I mean, even on the worst teams, uh, they could pull the plug. I, I just get a little scared looking at that profile. And just point two uh, wins above replacement, according to Fangraphs, in 33 games. Not a very good defender, it looks like, which is – I thought he – He's Just better. He's better mind. than that. Okay. He's better than that. That's I. I mean, I. I didn't watch I didn't watch a ton of Rangers this year. Uh-huh. Um, but he's Shocking. he's a better he's a better defender than that. Like he's he's got a chance to be a plus defender in center field. Um, obviously the speed is is there. Um, and really by Texas Rangers standards, like point two wins. Per thirty-three games isn't isn't that yeah, bad? Just being a, above the zero mark, being a, right. above <laughs> replacement level, not so bad for that team. Yeah, threshold's pretty low. Um, yeah, man, I, I just I look at him and I get a little scared. By the way, we can take our official Danny Santana victory lap. Uh, oh, good. We've been waiting right. on that. Uh, that's one we got right this year for sure. Uh, by the way, these next three pitchers bunched up in terms of ADP. I I have a clear favorite it's not even that close for me uh michael kopech adp 223 mackenzie gore 236 and then nate pearson 239 is this an easy call for you and if so who is it um i think a lot is gonna a lot could change with these three guys between now and opening day in terms of how i'm valuing them i mean to me they're really just kind of all high risk flyers but I'm going to take Nate Pearson, the guy who finished the year um, in the majors. And like, I, I just have the least concerns about his role for 2021. I still think he's a, a, at a high risk from an injury standpoint. Um, but like Michael Kopech, I mean, who, who knows what, what 2021 is going to be like for him? I mean, that's just a total lottery ticket in that range. Mackenzie Gore, I mean, there, there's just not a ton of info out there on, on what he was like at the alternate training site. I mean, yeah, that's a little scary for, for all, for all we know. I mean, he, he might be dealing with something. Um, that's not a team that's ever been really forthright about injuries to the media. So uh, maybe it was just performance that he, that he didn't come up, but regardless of what the reason was, it's not great. So I just feel more confident in, in Pearson's role heading into the year, but I, I definitely view all these guys as, as very high risk. Yeah, Gore was going to be my runaway choice just because of the uncertainty with the other two. Kopech opted out, his elbow you don't know about. And Pearson, I know he returned to throw, what, a couple innings on the final day, one and two-thirds on the final weekend. But I, I just think things were trending so poorly for him. I'm still very scared about that elbow. And, of course, the velocity – uh, that he throws with and Gore, yeah, I think with him it's it's definitely a, a, a flyer, an upside pick. But I'd rather chase a guy like that than uh, take a guy who I really feel like is a high risk from an injury standpoint. Uh, maybe Gore can be considered that as well. But I feel a little bit better, even with the uh, lack of info from the alternate side. I feel best about him among that bunch. Uh, the next bunch you have here: Bobby Dahlbeck, Andrew Vaughn, Alex Kirilov. It was a Pretty funny move, I thought, for the Twins to 
play Kirilov in the final in the final game after their offense, you know, just kind of like a hail mary, like save us from our eighteen game postseason losing streak. Um, he was unable to do that for the Twins, but do you think Kirilov could end up being the most valuable from this bunch of players? I I think he could be. Uh, I I really like Andrew Vaughn and Alex Kirilov at these prices. I think uh, with both guys, we're probably looking at a April promotion. I mean, given the White Sox track record, I wouldn't even be surprised if they reached a long term deal with Vaughn before the start of the season, so that he could just be the the DH right out of the gate. They uh, there were some comments from Rick Hahn kind of at the end of the year that I think sort of suggested that they're planning on him just being the Edward Encarnacion replacement uh, for 2021. That probably comes with some service time manipulation if they don't uh, strike a long term agreement. But I think we see Vaughn up pretty early. And I mean, he's, he's definitely a, a big time masher. Uh, Kirilov may be a bit more complicated in terms of where he plays, but, um, you know, Nelson Cruz is a free agent. Um, there's some moving pieces there. I, I, I could see him just finding a way in. I mean, Byron Buxton's, you know, often injured. Um, you know, Kepler struggled. Uh, I, just, I think there's ways of Kirilov finding his way into that mix. And the fact that they thought he was ready enough to be on that in that postseason lineup basically sort of tells you that they think he's he's pretty much ready. And um, so, yeah, I, I think both those guys, where they're going, you have to view them as stashes. I mean, so stashing season is, is already upon us. Mm. But you know, especially for these drafts, like if you're doing a draft champions draft and you can get either of these guys uh, kind of around this range, you're not going to be able to start them probably on opening day, but you'll probably be able to start them for most of the season. Yeah, outside of pick 300, you know, in the NFBC, you're looking at probably one stash, but I think he'd be a viable one, Kirilov. And you, we didn't get a ton of reports from the alternate sites, but I did see a report on Kirilov that he was hitting like 800 over there. So I do think he's probably ready. Dahlbeck, on the other hand, you know, I could see taking the the flyer on Vaughn or Kirilov. Dahlbeck, a lot of homers, but I just don't trust that batting profile for any player, but it's just so extreme in Dahlbeck's case. Yeah, and it's not a again, it's it's not like a unique skill set. Like getting a guy that's just gonna strike out a ton and hit a bunch of homers, like that's just that's not someone that I'm going to be going after there. I mean, 42.4 um, K rate last year. Ooh, not yeah, what you want. Like, I'm not saying like 251. It's like, that's not crazy. I'm sure there are a bunch of mediocre players going around there, but when you can get Vaughn two rounds later or Kirilov four rounds later, I think that it's a, uh, it's a bad use of draft capital. Yeah. I could see some people looking at him being like, well, You know, Dahlbeck's got the security. He's going to be playing from day one. I could start him, give me some power. But I think that's one where when you just have that kind of batting profile, the downside is too great to to take on. He could start the year as as an everyday player, uh, kill your batting average for three weeks and get sent down. Like that's (laughs) 100%. That's a fun way to begin a season. Uh, This next group here, pretty interesting. A lot of guys who, you know, very much uncertain. I could see their careers going a number of ways, but Dane Dunning, Tariq Skubal, Davey Garcia, Casey Mize, Adbert Alzale, and Spencer Howard. Howard, we were we were on. Uh, it didn't go his way. I know he dealt with some like blister issues, maybe an injury, but uh, to see him last among this group, I still think is, is a little surprising. Last in terms of ADP. I think people are pretty wise to the fact that Howard is probably still hurt. Um, you know, I, I think you were 100% right to mention that Nate Pearson still a, a big injury risk, even though he returned Howard to me, an even bigger injury risk, because I don't think at any point during this past season, did he look like himself? He didn't look like the pitcher we saw in the Arizona fall league from a stuff standpoint. Uh, it just wasn't as sharp. The velocity wasn't as consistent. In fact, the velocity became a pretty big issue for him down the stretch. And then, of course, he ends the year with the uh, the arm injury. So, yeah, you're getting a decent discount there. I mean, if he just is totally over, 
the arm issue next year. Maybe that's a, a steal, but I'm, a, I'm operating under the assumption that he's still hurt until proven otherwise. Um, I, you know, to me, I, I don't love many of these guys. I kind of like Tariq Skubal if the ADP is 296 because he did show some flashes down the stretch of kind of putting things together. Uh, he at least ended the year healthy. Um, you know that he's going to be in that rotation. They're going to probably let him pitch through some struggles again next year. Um, so I, I don't mind Scooble as a, as a flyer late in drafts. Uh, don't see much upside with Dunning. Um, you know, I think, I think all these guys are just incredibly risky, but like we mentioned earlier in the show, uh, the starting pitching market is just so awful that you're going to have to start taking flyers on guys that you don't really like that much in this rank. Yeah. I was going to say that I don't really like any of these guys, but Dunning did have a pretty decent run. Um, you know, three nine seven ERA. You, you don't trust him though. You don't. You don't see that as nearly sustainable. I just don't. I just don't think the stuff's that good. I mean, I think he's just kind of a a solid like number four starter. Um, yeah, ninety one point one fastball average. Swing strike rate was okay, but yeah, the stuff just doesn't seem like it's gonna overpower really. You know, challenge major league hitters consistently. Uh, let's talk about catchers, everybody's favorite position. Uh, Joey Bart, 306. That doesn't seem terrible for a two-catcher league. I know you're kind of a Ryan Jeffers guy. What What do you like about Jeffers of the Twins? He's just got he's just got all kinds of power, man. He's he's just so so strong, uh, makes such an impact when he connects, and he's been a pretty good hitter throughout his uh, minor league career as well. I mean, they, they pushed him fairly aggressively for a catcher and he's improved his defense to the point where he's a pretty good receiver back there. So uh, I'm going to have a lot of Ryan Jeffers next year, I'm guessing, because I'm, I'm probably going to wait at least on my second catcher, maybe on, on both catcher spots, depending on where guys are going. But um, I mean, obviously the, the main concern with Jeffers is just the playing time. Like you assume Mitch Garber, uh, they probably maybe they open the year in like a 50 50 split maybe it's 60 40 in garver's favor but but you know um, garver's not going to wrestle away too much of that just because he consistently hasn't been able to play that much right right so you know taking a catcher that you think is going to perform even if it's only in 45 percent of his team's games i would rather have that like a guy that maybe hits like 260 and hits like 15 homers something like that like Sign me up uh, as my second catcher. Uh, I think you're right about Bart, though. I mean, at 306, uh, the shine has just come all the way off on this yeah. guy. I mean, I, I was never the highest man on him, but he's still a, a really good young catcher. And I'm not super worried about the playing time there. Like, I know Buster Posey's going to gonna still play, but I think they have every incentive to try to develop Bart and, and kind of see what they have in him, and he can play first base. They, you know, they can move guys around, and um, in, in this range, it's probably your second catcher. But even if it's your first catcher, maybe maybe you do a double tap and you get Bart and Jeffers or something like that. Um, I don't, I don't hate it. Yeah, that'd be better than my guy this year, Austin Romine, my cheap catcher. <laughs> Didn't work out, but catcher yeah. was. That was, was awful horrible for me man. this past year, man. If you didn't have Real Muto, you were just SOL pretty much. Uh, but, yeah, with Bart, I mean, 30 – I know he came up and had, like, a couple nice doubles early on, but 36.9% K rate, only 2.7 walk rate. And, yeah, 33 games, that's enough to just lose your, your shine completely, I guess. And uh, maybe that creates a buying opportunity on Bart. Well, let me ask you this, though. What, like – When's how often do even really good catching prospects just come up and set the world on fire? Like there, you can't remember the last one aside from Gary Sanchez. Like sometimes it's like a two or three year period of them kind of figuring things out Mm -hmm. offensively. It's it's such a tough position to, you know, when you're you're catching the big league staff and you're trying to develop as a as a hitter against big league pitchers. I mean, there's there's a pretty steep learning curve there. So I just I don't know why. Like I didn't have any Bart. Uh, last year, but I don't know why people were expecting him to just come up and be awesome. I mean, that that so rarely happens. 
I think people have kind of backtracked too far the other direction. Even a guy like Will Smith, who ended up having a nice year and DHing a lot during the postseason, you know, he didn't have a completely straight line to success. He had some some major issues at the end of last season. So tough position to play and tough to you know play that position defensively and hit at a high level. Uh, very uh, very tough to ask of a young player. Uh, some other catchers I'll just throw out there: Sam Huff, Tyler Stevenson. Hoping to see him with a bigger role next year. Alejandro Kirk, a little bit of a surprise to me. And then Adley Rutschman, anything you want to add about those catchers? I think of that bunch, I like Kirk the most. Um, I think, I mean, it was a big jump in competition for him getting the call last year. But, I mean, the, the approach transferred over about as well as could be expected with him. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think they're going to give up on Danny Jansen, but I think Kirk has a has a pretty solid shot to enter enter the year as you know at least a timeshare there, and I don't think he's going to hurt your batting average. And there is some power upside with him, and so if he's going outside the top three fifty, I'm okay with him being my second catcher at that price. He's a little bit like a Williams Astadio type, right? But with more power. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the. The approach in the minors was very Estadio, Luis Arias, like, you know, where it's just not striking out, walking. Uh, but, yeah, there, there is more power there than Estadio. Um, he's improved his defense as well. I mean, he, part of the reason I was so low on – I wasn't so low on him as a prospect, but, like, was definitely too low on him is because I, I definitely thought there were concerns about him sticking a catcher. And they've got – like Gabriel Moreno's on the way in that system, so just wasn't sure about his long-term role with the club. But the fact that he's kind of up and didn't really struggle that much in the majors, I think that he's at least worth a, a dart late in drafts. Here's a name that maybe some people forgot, but a really electric arm. Uh, excuse me, Emmanuel Classe of the Cleveland Indians. He was hurt, then suspended for a PED bold denon. Um, don't know much about that specific drug, but... Uh, you know, everybody's jumping on James Karinczak, and, and for good reason, after they a uh, non-tendered Brad Hand. But do you think maybe Klasse, with, with the stuff he has, could maybe factor into that mix? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I would be taking him. Like, if I was doing a, a online championship draft right now, I don't think I would take him. But in the draft and hold format, I, I, I totally get it because, you know, closer's a wasteland. Karinczak he's definitely a strikeout machine and uh, certainly worthy of being taken inside the top 200 right now. But the walk rate is always a big issue with him. And I mean, you could envision that maybe, maybe he's just more effective for them in, in kind of a fireman role uh, working, you know, getting four outs in a, in a high leverage spot. And then, Klasse has definitely got the stuff for the ninth inning. I mean, we'll see how he looks in spring training. I think that'll be a, a big test with him because there's there's been makeup issues with him in the past. Then, he, like even before the PD suspension, so you just you don't know what kind of shape he's in. You know what what his arm is like right now. But uh, I could see you know maybe ten months from now if we're just looking at Klasse as the closer and Karinchek as the the lights out setup man as as one of the best young bullpens in baseball. Yeah, that'd be pretty nasty if they're both running as they as we know they can at the back end for Cleveland. That'd be pretty crazy. And yeah, it seems like the ideal draft champions target drafting at this point, drafting closers at this point, so hard. Uh, you know, guys are going to be displaced via free agent signings. You know, guys are going to get hurt, lose their jobs, and it's just you have to load up. I usually go with the quantity route in those those late rounds. Doesn't always pay off, but if you can get a get a guy like Classe who uh, at least has a, a path you can see to closing, I think that's a good way to go. Uh, Christian Pache, Jazz Chisholm, Jared Oliva. Uh, I kind of like Oliva outside the top 400, given he's, he runs. Chisholm, I was a little disappointed with his run in the big leagues. How much has his stock taken a hit in your eyes? Not. Nah. Not, a, not much at all. Uh, really, the only thing that I didn't like was um, his sprint speed. Um, if I can pull that up quick. You know, he 
like Chisholm to me is very similar to Joe Adele, where I don't think people had the right expectations if they are just kind of in shock about how how bad he was. Like this was always going to be a guy where where strikeouts were going to be an issue for him early in his career, and it's just kind of a bet on the the tools coming through. I mean, he's um, he's one of those guys where he could still do a ton of damage with a high K rate and you kind of expect him to uh, make some pretty significant improvements um, between year one and year two. Uh, but he was in the 81st percentile uh, for sprint speed, which, you know, that's kind of like above average runner. And he definitely, the, the quantity was there in terms of stolen base attempts for him. I mean, he, he, uh, stole more bases than Joe, Joe Adele attempted last year. So, I mean, at least he's trying to run. Um, but I'd maybe cap that ceiling a little bit in terms of like 15 to 18 steals for him in a, in a good scenario. Um, I would have maybe hoped that that sprint speed was maybe closer to uh, truly plus. Um, but power's there, speed's there. I think especially in a draft champions format, you you probably expect Chisholm to be playing every day by like late May, early June. Um, so I I don't mind him there. I mean, really, this range it's tough to nitpick too much. But um, yeah, I think really all these guys outside the top three hundred and fifty, there, there's a little bit to like. Yeah, I kind of had a desperation move in our uh, main event that we were running together. Picked up Chisholm and just dug us further down in the standings. Sorry about that, James. He just didn't look ready to me, Chisholm, from what I saw. And looking at his Savant page, he hit he hit under 200, under 190 against fastballs breaking and off-speed pitches. I just worry now that the Marlins are surprisingly, you know, their window to compete's kind of moved up, it seems like. I just wonder if they'll give Chisholm much of a leash uh, to start if he's, you know, still looking this unrefined uh, by by uh, early next season. Uh, what about Oliva? Do you did you like what you see, saw from him and uh, his chances of playing regularly next year? Um, I mean, they've definitely got openings. I think in that outfield, um, I would not be surprised if he opened the year in the minors if there is a minors, um, mm-hmm. and then Just maybe off the big league up. roster. Yeah, I mean, he'll he'll probably be competing for a spot in camp, but um, you know, I, I think four eighteen is pretty fair because you just you don't know what you what you can expect from a playing time standpoint. You're right about the, the stolen base upside, obviously, uh, but playing time and then performance at the plate. Like we don't know is he even going to hit enough to to keep a job. Like if he if he gets handed one, uh, that's part of the reason he's never been like a top 75 type of prospect. He's always kind of hovered around that top 100 range. Um, Tons of upside. Sprint speed in the 96th percentile, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Not only is he super fast, but he's really good at, at, at reading pitchers and and getting good jumps. So, I mean, that, that part of the skill set's not really in question. It's just, is he going to hit enough uh, to not hurt you kind of in the other four categories? And then when when do we see him? How often do we see him? I think that that's all sort of TBD. But he's one of those guys where if he has a big spring training and it's like, yeah, he's he's clearly one of their nine best hitters and, and he's probably going to break camp. Then all of a sudden you're talking about a guy who could be going a lot higher in, in drafts in March. Now this last group of very late pitchers in terms of ADP, some interesting names here. Uh, Tanner Houck, who had a you know pretty impressive run late. Uh, Garrett Crochet, Luis Patino, Clark Schmidt, Matt Manning, Logan Gilbert, Adrian Morihone, and A.J. Puck. Puck, you know, the shoulder, you hate to see it. I was really excited about him. But Clark Schmidt, another guy who seems to just be losing steam. There's so much excitement about him uh, in spring training. Then they came up, used him out of the bullpen. I, I, I'm throwing away, you know, his his sample this year. And I still really like the stuff and think you can dream on it. I'm surprised he's not – going higher just as a speculative pick yeah these guys are all going in that sort of end game range if, if we're talking about you know projecting forward to like the main event you could picture yourself ending up with one of these guys with one of your last picks um i yeah i'm definitely not out on schmidt by by any means uh 
there's a lot that can happen this offseason to sort of determine where we think he'll be in terms of role entering next season. Maybe they don't do much in terms of adding starting pitching and they, they just kind of trust their young guys. And maybe he has a good spring training and then all of a sudden you're, you're looking at a guy who is, is viable in all formats. But uh, definitely kind of a wait and see guy just from a, a role standpoint. But uh, I'm still all in on him in Dynasty. Uh, one guy, a couple guys that I think are pretty good values here, uh, in addition to Schmidt, are Luis Patino with the the Padres. Again, like total flyer, um, but he he missed a ton of bats in his kind of multi inning bullpen role last year. They still view him as a starter long term, so I think he will be able to kind of compete for that type of job in camp. So I don't I don't mind him as a dart at all. Still a, a very high ceiling with Luis Patino. And then uh, Logan Gilbert with the Mariners. Um, I know there, there are other sites that are higher on him than I am for Dynasty, but it's pretty clear to me that he's going to be a part of that rotation for the vast majority of 2021. I think that in a regular season, he would have been up for a good chunk of this past year. And uh, all the reports from the alternate site are, are strong on Gilbert. So, um, you know, he could even break camp in the rotation. That wouldn't surprise me. You know, at worst, we're talking about like a, a late April uh, call up for Gilbert. So I think getting him outside the top 400, uh, I don't think he's going to be a league winner or anything. But with starting pitching as scarce as it is, getting a healthy guy with uh, number three starter upside who's got a pretty clear job awaiting him is, is not a bad value. Yeah, uncovering some diamonds in the rough from this group would be huge uh, toward winning a championship in 2021. Uh, I'll be putting in a lot of time myself trying to figure out who who the best picks in this range are because, yeah, as you said, you're going to have to hold your nose and take some of these guys and just hope you can extract some value. Now, we talked about that group. That's the end game in most drafts. Now, this is this next group, this final batch of players we'll talk about, well beyond that group, these guys are only really going in those draft champion, draft and hold leagues very late. Uh, some of these guys you feel like are going way too late. Can you tell us who those are? Yeah, the the first one, and this one I expect to just have a very steep uh, incline in ADP as we get closer to March, is, is Jeter Downs. I think he is very clearly their second baseman of the future in Boston, and a guy where I, I basically am expecting them to just play service time games with him and call him up in, in late April. I mean, I think we, we talked about Alex Kirilov and Andrew Vaughn earlier. Like Downs is another guy who's a top 25 prospect for Dynasty and is basically big league ready. I mean, he you look at like where he finished 2019, uh, a year at summer camp. I mean, he, he performed well there. I even saw a Red Sox beat writer speculating that he might have gotten the call last year. I, I never really bought into that because it wouldn't have made much sense given how bad they were. But, like, he's basically ready. So getting a guy that could hit 20-plus homers and steal 20 bases and play every day for the Red Sox outside the top 500, like, that's that's crazy value. So yeah. uh, I, think it's, I think he's probably just kind of, like, out of sight, out of mind. Like, there haven't been enough. Uh, people really talking about him in terms of where his ETA is at, but I mean, stolen bases really tough to find, obviously. And uh, Downs will give you those, and he's got plenty of power for for middle infielder. So I think Downs is a big time value. And then I'll just list these pitchers. I mean, Thomas Hatch with the Blue Jays, Trevor Rogers, who even debuted last year and struck out a ton of guys, albeit with. Uh, pretty poor results in most of those starts, but I think he's got a, a rotation spot. And then Edward Cabrera, also with the Marlins, I think he'll be up for most of the year if he's healthy. Keegan Aiken, I mean, I know that he wasn't a big prospect, but he, he struck out a ton of guys with the Orioles. He's definitely going to be in that rotation. So you got a guy with a job who missed bats. Like, even if he's pretty bad, he shouldn't be going outside the top 600. And then Jackson Cower with the Royals, to me, he's a very similar pitching prospect to Logan Gilbert, just from an upside standpoint and a readiness standpoint. So I think uh, Cower is a, a really great value there. And then Corbin Martin, uh, he was obviously part of the, the famous Fabapalooza from a couple of seasons ago, uh, was traded to the Diamondbacks in the Zach Granke trade. And he 
missed last year with Tommy John surgery, but he's going to have had, I think, over 18 months, I think, to recover from that by opening day. And he projects as part of the Diamondbacks rotation for, for quite a long time. Um, not exactly sure when he gets his chance, but still a top 200 pitching prospect who's pretty much big league ready. So uh, another good value outside the top 600. Yeah, you know, Fabapalooza seems like another lifetime ago. And I admit that I kind of forgotten about Corbin Martin myself, so I'm glad you reminded me, and I'm going to have to check to be sure he's on our Outlook list uh, to be sure he's on in the well, magazine. I'm writing him up. Don't oh, worry okay. About yeah, I, I just know that since he's, you know, kind of an afterthought, I just wanted to confirm. But good to know. Appreciate James. Um, you've already done a couple of drafts, right, or one? Yeah. Yeah, I did. So I did uh, two draft champions the the 50 round slow draft draft and holds uh was able to do those on fan tracks actually and then they're going to be inputted onto the nfbc website but those were um back kind of in that man i want to say those started during the postseason maybe just right after the postseason but um yeah those seemed like a while ago already um i i would have done some stuff differently in those but I thought it was a nice opportunity to get a lot of the guys we've been talking about. Um, and yeah, I, I would recommend like the, the guys we talked about that are going way too early, way too late. Like now is the time to get in there and do some draft champions. If you, uh, if you got the scratch and you got the itch, um, I think there's, there's definitely plenty of value to be had out there. Yeah. Scratch that itch. Oh, I might have to do that. Usually this time of year I have completed a draft, but with no no Arizona Fall League, no uh, first pitch Arizona, I have not. So I'm looking forward to dabbling in some drafts soon enough. Uh, hopefully a few of these uh, chips fall in free agency soon. Uh, I know, you know, not a free agent move, but good to see Stroman make his decision with the qualifying offer. I think that deadline is today, so we'll be tracking that all over at rotowire.com. Rotowire.com slash pod for a free 10-day trial. James, always good to see your face, man, and talk with you. It's been too long. You're the best at what you do, and uh, we'll be doing this again in a couple weeks. Yeah, and and let me do uh, that uh, Young Back Company giveaway. Sorry about Um, that. So, uh, again, this this is Young Back Company. Um, Let me just talk about the prize first before laying out the contest specifics. Uh, Tom from the Young Back Company is going to donate a mug with a player uh, of the winner's choosing on the mug. And these mugs are they are basically the barrel of a wooden bat with the player's image and signature engraved on the barrel. They're MLBPA licensed now, which is which is really cool. Oh, nice. Uh, you can check them out at, at youngbackcompany.com. They also have a, a Dodgers World Series Championship edition if the winner happens to be a, Do- a Dodgers fan. Um, and the contest is, it's pretty simple. So you basically have to convince me that I'm too high or too low on a player in my top 400 prospect rankings. And you can send me a direct message on Twitter at real J.R. Anderson with your case for or against a player. And whoever gives me the most convincing argument for why I'm wrong about a certain prospect will get the young back company mug of their choosing. And in addition, I will present the winning argument on our next podcast. And if it's convincing enough, I'll adjust my ranking on that player. Uh, So the deadline for that is going to be the end of the month. Uh, Our next podcast is going to be December 2nd. So just send me a DM before then and uh, try to convince me why I'm too high or too low on a guy. Um, I'd probably say you have a a better chance further down my rankings you go because I'm pretty set in stone, especially on guys that are sort of top 10, top 20. Um, but I'm, I'm just interested to hear. I mean, some of the best uh, tip-offs I get on some prospects come from our listeners and just saying, hey, like, you should be higher on this guy or, uh, like, what about X, Y, and Z on this prospect? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think there will be tons of good submissions. Um, so definitely try to make yours convincing. And if you have the best one, you'll get a, a young back company mug. Yeah, that's very cool. I'm looking forward to hearing some of these arguments. Uh, they better be strong, not flimsy. Uh, yeah, or else we'll don't tear bring, them apart. Don't bring anything weaker yeah, on here. <laughs> Get that shoved back in your face if you try it. Uh, appreciate it, James. Thank you all for listening, and thanks to the Young Back Company for this little giveaway. This is very cool. Friends of the Pod, and we'll be discussing all the entries. 
Uh, wouldn't you say December 3rd? I'll be pull- uh, December 2nd. December so 2nd. Just, just get it to me before the end of November. Nice. I'll be pulling myself out of a deep uh, PS5 slumber at that point. <laughs> uh, James, good stuff, man. And thank you all for listening. We'll be back with the Rotowire Prospect podcast on December 2nd. Hope to talk to you then.